There's no sign. No. no. We checked it earlier on. I mean, how to check it actually? Push on the mic. Are you sure? Let me see. Ave Maria, sorry for the technical um, difficulties. That's one for next year's blooper reel. Um, but perhaps we'll just introduce the topic once more, Father. Um, so we can say cheers again. <laughs> Hopefully they can hear now. Hopefully you can hear the, the clink of the glasses. Um, so this is episode 108 of Tea with Mary. Um, the title is The Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, heaven on earth. So we have this beautiful title in light of yesterday's feast of St. John Hughes, who is the great apostle of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, French saint. And also we have this show in light of Monday's magnificent feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, 22nd of August. So before we get um, get into this uh, wonderful topic, we will be led by in a prayer by Father Seraphim. All right, so let's pray to our Blessed Mother today. We pray to St. Bernard. That uh, this great uh, Marian canto to help us understand the mystery hidden in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Immaculate Heart of Mary. Pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Ralio, now uh, it's your time. I think we should introduce this beautiful topic with some reflections presented to you by Ralio, if you like. Now. Okay, well, well, I have perhaps one reflection, which um, we, we discussed earlier, but I was pondering earlier about our ladies relationship with the Holy Spirit, especially in light of the collect of Monday's Mass, which speaks of Our Lady's heart as the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost. Um, so I was thinking that it could mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Father, but it, this, this could mean that um, Our Lady's heart is the very, the very place where the espousal between her and the Holy Spirit took place, um, where the Holy Spirit um, basically met with her, her pure love of God, um, to conceive our Lord Jesus Christ first in her heart and then following from there um, in her womb. So we could call it, as, as you actually said earlier, Father, that Our Lady's heart could be called the bridal chamber of between Mary and the Holy Spirit, um, where our Lord is, 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 is in a sense first conceived um, before he's um, made incarnate in her womb. And I was also thinking in, in regards to a, a certain private revelation to um, Mary of Agreda, um, in, in her wonderful work, The Mystical City of God, she actually speaks of our Lord being formed in the womb by three drops of blood from Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. Um, so there's a kind of connection there, that, that three drops of blood flow from Our Lady's heart into her womb, um, and the Holy Spirit basically animated that blood and, and, and caused our Lord to be incarnated in her womb. So um, that's just a, a, a reflection, but I don't know if it's if it's yes, yes. In sound, but I think it is very good, especially the bridal chamber that you referred to before. Uh, yes, we maybe we can ex expand a little bit more to let people understand more precisely the union, the spousal union between Our Lady and the Holy Spirit. It is a real union, right? Because the very essence of the union is love, is the union of the will. Mm. So between Our Lady and the Holy Spirit, there is a real spousal union because they came to be one, united in one will, one love. And the moment of this profound uh, union is the Annunciation, when the Holy Spirit came upon her and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her like a, a husband who took care of her wife. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is the moment when the Holy Spirit comes, but there is also Our Lady's consent to that union, right? Yes. Our Lady's consent is her feet, 
when she replies uh, with her freedom to that message and to that coming of the Holy Spirit. She is willing to welcome the Holy Spirit who is coming upon her. So this is the first thing to, to say in order to understand precisely what you beautiful, beautifully say about that chamber, that uh, place where they uh, met and were united in, this, in, in, in marriage. So there is a real marriage and there is the place where that marriage took place. Yes, and yes. the place is the Immaculate Heart of Mary because the Holy Spirit abides in Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. The Holy Spirit is present in her heart, as the liturgy also points out. The, the Immaculate Heart of Mary is the, the abode of God on earth. It is the chamber where the Holy Spirit came to make uh, the incarnation possible. The, that union, spousal union with the Holy Spirit is in view of the incarnation. And the incarnation took place in Our Lady's womb, but before uh, coming to her womb, the incarnation was already present in Our Lady's heart, right? Because Our Lady said yes to God. Yes to God, the Father, obeying His will, uh, the Son, who is coming to take place in her, and the Holy Spirit, who is the, the, the very, uh, uh, the, very uh, the person who, who makes this, this incarnation possible, the means, the instrument. Of course, not the simple instrument, but uh, the one who, uh, through whom the incarnation is made possible. So, yes, this is, this is very important to say. And uh, yes, the three drops of blood coming is also from the heart. Yes, right? from, the, from the heart, from the heart uh, is another beautiful reflection to introduce this, uh, this topic, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, there is just another thing I forgot to mention with regards to that point. Um, with regards to the title, we call it Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, Heaven on Earth. And seeing as this is the bridal chamber, Our Lady's heart, between the Holy Spirit and Our Lady herself, it's in a sense the place where heaven meets earth, where God and the creature kind of meet. Um, so that could be another reason why we could call Our Lady's Immaculate Heart the heaven on earth, because it's, as you said, the dwelling place of yes. the Holy Spirit. Um, yes. yes, it is the, where, the place where Our Lady meets with God. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> so we can also say that the Immaculate Heart is created by God as the very heaven on earth to make his presence possible mm -hmm. because God's presence is ineffable. He abides uh, the heavens and uh, he can only uh, be uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in his heaven, right? Because heaven is actually what is heaven. Heaven is the place where God is, yes. uh, where His infinity, His majesty, His love is. So God can be present only where there is this, so to speak, this place which, which is dignified, which is uh, uh, suitable for His infinite majesty. And the very place outside God, outside the Trinity, which uh, was suitable for Him, to be present, to abide in, was and is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, it is a beautiful definition to say that the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady is heaven on earth, because it is that resemblance of the God's heaven on earth. It is the, the place which uh, more perfectly matches that uh, infinity of God. Not in the sense that Our Lady's Immaculate Heart is infinite, but in the sense that it is so dignified, so pure, so mm. perfect, that it could only, uh, that it could be the only place where God could be. And this is the reason why it has made so, uh, so perfect by God to be, to be His presence on earth. <laughs> nice. Right, Frania, so we can 
add some more reflection, and then, of course, we invite uh, people at home to intervene with uh, their comments, if you wish. So, in the second part of our of our show, tea with Mel, I would like to just carry on and add some more thoughts to this uh, topic. As Fralia said, we are now in preparation for the Feast of the Immaculate Heart this uh, coming Monday, the 22nd, in the old, in the extraordinary form of the liturgy, in the old rite liturgy, we celebrate the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And uh, it is fitting that we together reflect on this uh, beautiful topic. I just want to say something about the origin of this uh, uh, consideration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Of course, if I ask you, where is the place where the Immaculate Heart of Mary is mentioned? What would you answer, Fralio? You can answer on behalf of the people at home. The, the first place where it's mentioned. Yes, I think that's. Uh, what do you think? I think uh, we discussed it would be Luke two nineteen. Right, but it is the gospel. The gospel, it? yes. The very origin of this uh, doctrine, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, is the gospel, and it is the Bible in its entirety because the heart in the Bible is a very, very significant, very present. Mm. And the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the heart of our Blessed Mother, is mentioned twice in the Gospel of St. Luke. We can uh, uh, say that it, the first time it is we have a reference to the Immaculate Heart of Mary is in the Gospel of Luke, where the birth of Jesus is accounted, is uh, told, and when the shepherds uh, came in haste, after the angelic uh, message to come and to adore the baby who was born. After these people who came, our lady was, so to speak, uh, she marveled at that joy, at that faith of these people coming uh, to flock to Jesus with their sheep to see our Lord. And the gospel says that our lady treasured uh, all treasured up, all these things in her heart. Or we can, can also say Our Lady kept all these things. What the shepherds were saying, their joy, their adoration, their faith, was the object of Our Lady's consideration. And she, she treasured, she kept all these things in her heart. Then there is also a second reference to the heart of our Blessed Mother, which is always in the Gospel of St. Luke, after the finding of Jesus in the temple, after the three days of uh, search and finding uh, of Jesus in the temple. You, you remember the episode, uh, which was something already foretelling the three days of Jesus' sorrowful passion, death and resurrection, it was anticipated. That's why the Gospel says that at the first, Mary and Joseph were not able to understand what Jesus replied to them. It was a very deep answer, because the reference was already to that uh, sorrowful moment and to his relationship with the Father. Don't you know that I have to be my father's business? Or better to say, my father's house. I have to remain in my father's house. And the father's house in the gospel of John is Jesus himself. He's the true temple. Destroy this temple and in three days, three days I will build it again. And he made reference to the temple of his body. So Jesus is pointing to that moment, his sorrowful passion, death, the destruction of the temple, and his re-edification after his resurrection. Right. Uh, in this context, the Gospel of St. Luke uh, says that Our Lady, uh, Our Lady again uh, kept or, or pondered all these things in her 
immaculate heart. Of course, we don't have the reference to the, to the objective, immaculate, but we do have the reference to the heart of our Blessed Mother. Uh, she uh, uh, pondered all these things. Which things? The mysteries of Christ, the mystery of his uh, 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 permanence in the temple, his finding after three days, and already with the help of Jesus, he's also understanding better and better the mystery uh, of Jesus' sorrowful passion, death and resurrection. All these were kept in her heart. Uh, to, to quote the gospel in this, in this, uh, the Knox version, Donald Knox version I have with me, that the translation is this one. And while his mother kept in her heart the memory of all this, she kept the memory of all this. So the heart of Mary is a storage place where all the mysteries, the memories of Christ, uh, uh, safely uh, kept, stored. Yes. There is also a beautiful reference by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth in one of his teachings. I think, if I'm not wrong, one of his catechisms, in which he says that Our Lady is the memory of Christ. Our Lady is the memory of Christ. Yes. This in, uh, in relation to this context. Our Lady who... Uh, keeps everything in her immaculate heart, all these memories, the memory of all these mysteries. So, uh, all mysteries of Christ are safely stored in her immaculate heart for the sake of the church, for the church. And in fact, after Jesus' ascension into heaven, what we see? We see Our Lady teaching the apostles. Our Lady is in the midst of the church, of the last the sample, and she, of course, teaches as the mother, the, the apostles and the church, mm -hmm. the, the early church. Why is she teaching, not Peter, for example, who is the, the foundation stone of the church? Because Our Lady is the memory of Christ, because all mysteries of Jesus are present, kept in her heart. It is the mother who knows perfectly the Son, who is able to pass on to the church the mysteries of which she is a, a personal witness. Mm. Well, could, could we say yes. that that's one reason why we, in a sense, pray the rosary, when we pray the rosary, we direct the prayers to Our Lady whilst meditating on the mysteries of Christ. So in a sense, we're asking Our Lady to open her immaculate heart to, to, to give us an insight into those mysteries which she lived herself. Yes. Um, so that's another example of us going through Mary yes. to, to, to meditate on our Lord's mysteries. Yes, this is the reason why we pray the rosary. Yes. Exactly. This is the precise reason for which we pray the rosary. The rosary is a way to go to Jesus perfectly through Mary because the mysteries of Christ are kept in the heart of Mary. Mm -hmm. If we pray the rosary, the Hail Marys, in union with the heart of our Blessed Mother, Basically, we meditate perfectly on the mysteries of Jesus because it is Our Lady who reveals to us these mysteries, who teaches us these mysteries. Yes, that's the precise reason for which we pray the Rosary and uh, another reason to see a biblical foundation of the Rosary. Right in this Gospel of St. Luke, Our Lady uh, pondered all these things or kept all in her heart. She kept precisely the memory of these mysteries. So if you don't want to lose your memory of Christ, if you want to lose sight of Jesus, you have to be united with our Lady. You have to be close to our Blessed Mother, to pray to her, to pray with her, in union with her, in order to be in union with Jesus not to lose track of Christ. Yes? Good. So this is the biblical foundation of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then, after, of course, this is a treasure hidden uh, present uh, 
in the in the gospel, in the Bible, the heart, as I said, is very present in the Bible. And then, little by little, in the Christian spirituality has been more developed. Especially, there is one saint, Fravio, this one, who has developed very much the the mystery of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This saint is who? This is a Saint John. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I'll say it in the English way, English, St. John Hughes. Hughes, yes, the English prefers to say Hughes, yeah. and the Italian Eudes. <laughs> but the name is, is French, I think. Yes, yes he's French. of course, he's a French saint, and we should say St. John, Saint, Saint John Eudes. 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 Yes, <laughs> who was born in 1601, and uh, he wrote a masterpiece on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which has been translated in English recently with a very good uh, publication. And this is The Admirable Heart of Mary by, by uh, St. John Hughes. Uh, a priest who uh, treasured very much the spirituality of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, all seen in union with the most sacred heart of Jesus. And uh, he uh, uh, developed this doctrine and uh, wrote extensively about this doctrine, especially in this masterpiece, as said, uh, dedicated to the heart of our blessed, our blessed Mother. He tries to present to the reader the treasures of the Immaculate Heart of Mary by considering a lot of uh, biblical symbolisms, uh, especially uh, taken from the Old Testament, which uh, uh, point to the to the mystery of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. For example, the Ark of the Covenant. But then he goes on by presenting also the doctors, the, the fathers of the Church, and the doctors and the saints who have spoken of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And among the doctors, for example, we cannot forget uh, Saint Augustine. St. Leo the Great, but also, uh, if you want, there are uh, uh, the saint that today we celebrate, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, is another Marian saint who, who already uh, spoke in his time uh, of the importance of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, drawing all these treasures from, from where? Of course, from the Gospel, from the Bible from the, the centrality of the heart. So we have St. Bernard as well. And then we come to the Franciscan spirituality with two great Franciscan saints who have spoken of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And these two saints are St. Bonaventure, the Seraphic Doctor, and St. Bernardine of Siena. I just wish to quote briefly one thing from St. Uh, Bonaventure. Bonaventure, is also had to be the composer of the office of our Blessed Mother, the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, in one of the passages, one of the Psalms uh, contained in this, uh, in the Psalterium of the Blessed Virgin Mary, there is a reference to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to the Heart of Mary as the source of salvation. He says in Latin, Omnis salus decorde Maria scaturizat. All salvation flows from the heart of Mary. It's very deep. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. All salvation comes from the heart of Mary. And also, always St. Bonaventure points out uh, the mystery of the Immaculate Heart of Mary as the true Ark of the Covenant. This is another beautiful reference. The ark contained, as you remember, <clears throat> a portion of the manna, among other things, such as the tablets, even of the law, and, uh, and uh, the rod of Aaron, the stick of Aaron, but also a portion of the manna, that miraculous bread that came from hell, a clear symbol of the Holy Eucharist. But if the ark, that sacred box, uh, 
kept the, the, the man. How much more our blessed mother is the Diak who kept in herself the true man, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. <clears throat> so, and the, um, Saint John Hughes presents these many saints who have extensively spoken of the mystery of the Immaculate Heart of Mary to say that uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary is a treasure of grace and the very compendium, if you want, of the mystery of, of our living. If you want to have a synthesis of all titles, Marian titles, Marian doctrines, all Marian dogmas, we have to look at the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It's the very nucleus, if you want, of all mysteries. It's the very, uh, how do you say, can we say crossroad, where all roads come and intersect. All roads have necessary, all roundabout, right? She's the, <laughs> to have an image in your mind. She's the very saint, the Immaculate Heart is the very center where all these mysteries of Ali are kept, especially her prerogatives as Immaculate, Mother of God, Ever Virgin, all dogmas, all titles. There are many, but in fact they are one, and they are all present in one place in this bridal chamber, which is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So let's treasure this devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and uh, we will be uh, in short with salvation, of course, because to love our lady is a guarantee of eternal salvation. I just finished this up by telling you that St. John Hughes was so devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, uh, to the point of writing also a mass in honor of the admirable heart of Mary. And that mass, liturgical text, was approved by the church together with the office. I finish this by quoting you the collect of this mass, which is very significant. When you want to understand the meaning of the liturgy of a, of a particular feast day, of a saint, go always to the collect, read it. It's, it's a summary of the theology of that the festivity and the and summary of the faith of the church. So the collect of this mass goes on this way. O God, who didst will that thy only begotten Son, who dost dwell with thee from all eternity, should live and reign in the heart of the Virgin Mary, grant us, we beseech thee, the grace to celebrate continually with one only heart, this most holy life of Jesus and Mary, to have but one heart with them, and one among ourselves, to accomplish thy will in all things, with a generous heart and resolute will, that so we may merit to become like to thy heart, through the same Lord, and so on. It's very... Very profound, very profound, yes. Especially the reference, uh, the reference in St. John Hughes is always to the unity of Jesus' heart with our lady's heart. They are two, but in fact one. And in this prayer, we uh, celebrate actually this unity of the two hearts, which are one single heart, and we uh, also ask for a particular grace to be. Uh, one heart with them and one heart among ourselves. It's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? So if we pray to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we pray for becoming one heart with her, which means one heart with Jesus and Mary, one heart with amongst ourselves, to be really in communion with all brethren uh, in Christ through Mary. All right, Fralio, you want to say something now? Before we pass to the okay, so yes, comments. I mean, there was something very interesting. I was reading uh, something written by Saint Maximilian about the the fact. This is with reference to our Lady as, as mediatrix of all grace. Her immaculate heart being the the source of a, a huge number of graces, obviously passing through her heart from our Lord. Um, and Saint Maximilian said that 
Um, the will of God, to quote him, the will of God and the will of the Immaculate are not exactly the same thing, because the will of the Immaculate is the will not of the justice, but of the mercy of God, of which the Immaculate is the personification. So I thought this was quite profound. So it's, it's basically saying that Our Lady has obviously, God's will and Our Lady's will is the same, but Our Lady is particularly, um, she's in a sense the personification of the mercy of God. So her mission is basically to save as many souls and to convert as many souls as possible through through distributing the graces given to her by our Lord. Um, so this is why we must have recourse to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart for the conversion of, of ourselves and also of, of those who don't believe in the world. And especially in, in today's time, there are so many people who have rejected our Lord and rejected Our Lady. But um, this is why it's more important now than ever to have recourse to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart because she's almost catering for for the most um, for the greatest sinners, and that, that's why that's why she wants to, to share with us this this mercy. So I thought it was very beautiful that that um, Saint Maximilian, in a sense, called Our Lady, uh, and by, by calling Our Lady, he's also calling her Immaculate Heart, the personification of the mercy of God, mm -hmm. um, where God's mercy dwells. Um, yes, it's very beautiful. Yes, uh, and this is what we pray in the Santa Regina's friend. Right? Yes, pray to our Blessed Mother. Who is uh, our life and, and, and the mercy, the mercy of God to us? Yes, that's beautiful. All right. So we invite uh, people at home who are following this show to comment or to send in the comments. I think they started already. We have quite a few for quite a few so far. Yes. All right. Should we answer some? Yes. Let's now? let's see. So we we greet everyone. Um, so Heidi, Ave Maria, yeah. um, Nicola Fazzoli, Ave Maria, Carol Smith is here, Hello. Uh, Mary Lindsay Scott, uh, John's father, Stephen Holt. Hello, Hello Stephen. Ave Maria. <laughs> um, and we have various others um, coming in, so we, we say hello to you all. Yes. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Goodlad asks, um, three drops of blood for the three persons of the Trinity. I think this is with reference to... To so your yeah. comments, no. you have to marry to marry Magdalena's comment. <laughs> what is that? Um, perhaps I mean that's quite a, a profound. Um, that's quite a profound comment. I mean, I guess Saint Francis we spoke of earlier make, makes the reference. I think it's the first. Is it the first reference um, to Our Lady as being um, daughter of the Father, a mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit? Right. So she has a sort of central role in the Holy Trinity. Um, so I guess that would be very fitting if the three, the reason that there were three drops was to symbolize her union with the Trinity. But mm -hmm. to be honest, I don't, I don't know for sure. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, we can read it in this way as well, in a Trinitarian way. And uh, yes, as you say, our lady spouse of the Trinity in the relation with the Holy Trinity. Let's not forget that uh, one of the first reference to Our Lady in relation with the Holy Trinity goes back to the 5th century, 5th century after Christ. And St. Francis is one of the first to point out that Trinitarian relationship of Our Lady with the Father, the Son, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit, so uh, uh, laid out in a very uh, precise way, making reference to Our Lady as the daughter of the Father, the mother of the Son, spouse of the Holy Spirit. Spouse of the Holy Spirit also is very, very profound. Already present before, but St. Francis is, is presenting it in a very definitive and precise way, yes. Then we have um, a question from Heidi. Is it correct to think of the heart as the will? So Mary's Immaculate Heart is her pure and perfect will. Yes, in fact, the heart is the symbol of the will, especially the will. If we want to be uh, precise, we should say that the heart in the Bible is the center of the person, where the person properly lives. So it is the center of the thoughts, the center of the desires, the choices, the, the will, in fact. But uh, uh, the will is more specifying, yes the symbolism of the, the heart. So to be one heart with Our Lady in effectively means to
to love our lady, to be one with, with our lady. And for our lady to be one heart, a spouse with the Holy Spirit, as we said earlier in this show. It means to be uh, one will, one love, one act of the will with the, the Holy Spirit by giving her consent and by remaining in that, persevering, of course, in that consent of love. So yes, the Immaculate Heart, the, the pure, and is the pure and perfect will and uh, we should also aim at having always this perfect will to love our lady mm. and to remain in her heart. Yes, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question is from Marco Fazzoli. He asks, are there any contradictions in saying that the Holy Spirit is Our Lady's spouse and that Jesus is her bridegroom, since they are two distinct persons? Mm. It's a question for you, maybe for you. Well, to be honest with you, this is, this is way above the capacity. <laughs> well, it, yes, thank you, Marco. It is a very good question. And it mm, highlights the, the, the spousal relationship of Our Lady with God. And uh, when we say God, of course, God is one nature, but three persons. So with God means possibly, so to say, with the Father, and then the Son and the Holy Spirit. The very uh, clear expression of this spousal union is found in Our Lady uh, being uh, espoused with the Holy Spirit. This is present in the tradition of the Church since the 5th century, and as I said before, St. Francis of Assisi uh, echoes this important tradition and perfects this important tradition. So, to present Our Lady as spouse of the Holy Spirit is normal, so to say. It, it is understandable. Uh, but Our Lady is the spouse of God. And if we look precisely at the early tradition of the Church, at some Church Fathers, we find out both in the West and in the East, the Western Fathers and also the Eastern ones, that there is an allusion, there is a reference also to Our Lady Spouse of God in relation with the Son. When she is uh, said to be Spouse of God, some of the Fathers, such as St. Maximum the Confessor or St. Peter Chrysologus, uh, to, to have two references, one from the East, one from the West, they both uh, make reference to Our Lady as spouse of God in uh, relation to the Son. This is a little bit more complicated to understand because there is a reaction immediately as we say that. How can a mother be the spouse of the Son? If she is the mother, how can she also be the, the, the spouse of the Son? It is not possible. Well, we have to understand this precisely. Our Lady is the mother, of course, but uh, she is also the new Eve uh, in relation to the first Eve, as Jesus is the new Adam in relation to the first Adam. Eve was espoused with uh, Adam, and they both fell because of that original temptation, original, fell into original sin. Eve contributed to that fall. So, Our Lady is the new Eve, and this is clear, this is presented by the Fathers, but uh, taken from Genesis in uh, red, in continuity with the New Testament, especially the Gospel of St. John. So, if Our Lady is the new Eve, she is, uh, though mysteriously, if you want, in a very unique manner, a spouse with the new Adam. And this espousal has to be understood in light of the same espousal of Our Lady with the Holy Spirit, not in a physical way, as we normally understand it, but in a supernatural way. With that union of the will, with that union of the heart, this is the espousal about. The union of the heart of Jesus and Mary, that profound union is an is, is a, uh, an espousal uh, love, espousal union. So yes, Our Lady can also be said as the bride of Christ, uh, the bride of our Lord, who is in uh, uh, in relation to Our Lady, the bridegroom. So and 
And finally, these two references to Our Lady Bright of God in relation to the Holy Spirit, in relation to the Son, can also be applied uh, indirectly, if you want, to the Father. Our Lady stars on the Father in some way, a little bit more difficult to grasp because the Holy, the Holy, the Father remains invisible, so to say. He does is not uh, present. He's not incarnate, of course. He's the one who sends forth without being sent. Uh, but in any case, also uh, there is there is uh, a union, spousal union with the Father for the sake of Christ, the Son. They, Mary and the Father have the same Son in common, so they share in this union. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have a comment from Harold John Bosco who says, Scientifically speaking, through the concept of microchimerism, the Immaculate Heart of Mary is one with the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus. Wow, maybe it's a question for you, friend. But I have <laughs> no clue. It sounds micro, micro chimerism. Chimerism. Um, I'm not not a chimerism. Sorry, chimerism. Micro chimerism. I'm not well into this, but uh, of course. Uh, our Lady's Immaculate Heart is one with Jesus, and they are inseparable. You can you can uh, separate the light from the sun or from the rays, right? Mm -hmm. But you can never separate Our Lady from Jesus. This is what Saint Louis Grignon de Montfort brilliantly says in his true devotion to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. Our Lady and Jesus are inseparable. That's why there are two in, two hearts. Who, which, in, in fact, uh, one single heart. The union is so profound, yes. Mm. From Damien, we have a question. Ave Maria, as for the reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary that Our Lady asked at Fatima, are there any other devotions for this purpose other than that of the first five Saturdays? The devotion to the Immaculate Heart? Yes. Do you know any, Fabio? Well, so we have some... The, some of the technicians are, are very big devotees of Our Lady of Sorrows. Um, so obviously, <laughs> by, by, by praying, for example, the, the chaplet of the Our Lady of Sorrows, um, we meditate on the sorrows which, which pierced Our Lady's heart you know, throughout her life. Right. Um, so it's a, very, it's a very beautiful way to unite our sufferings to the sufferings, to the sufferings of Our Lady um, at the foot of the cross. And also, I mean, we have to, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Father, but it's a, it's a good way to see, our, when we see our, our Lady's heart pierced with, with a sword of sorrow or something like that, it helps us to understand that, um, I mean, Our Lady is, is our model, it helps us to understand that pure love requires sacrifice. Um, so we can't, we can't have a pure love for Christ unless in some way our heart has to go through trials as well. Um, for, I mean, pierced, pierced, like Our Lady's was pierced by a sword. So it's not going to be easy um, all the time to, to follow our Lord and we have to we have to offer we have to sacrifice we have to make sacrifices in order to to reach him perfectly so yes um, yes yes of course yes uh, the love is sacrificial without sacrifice there is not true love and the love of Christ which is the perfect love is sacrificial love to the end love uh, to the death of the cross and uh, this is the true Love the love by which Jesus loved us, and Our Lady too loved us in this uh, sacrificial love by being our co redemptrix. So, right, mm -hmm. uh, devotion to Our Lady's seven dollars is a devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mm -hmm. We make a reparation to her Immaculate Heart. And uh, is there any other devotion in case? I'm not aware of any other. But uh, uh, of course, if you uh, the devotion spread by Saint John Hughes, uh, devotion to the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, and then developed afterwards, is also uh, a devotion that we, uh, uh, for for example, the enthronement of the most sacred hearts in a house, it is another way to be devoted to the Sacred Hearts and to make reparation one's home to the most Sacred Hearts of Jesus and 
Mary. Yes, um, all these ways are possible means to, to honor the Immaculate Heart and to make a reparation, yes. So we have a question from Rebecca. Can we say heaven is on earth within the Immaculate Heart of Mary because she never left heaven? She dwells in and with the Holy Trinity from her conception. She is eternally with God as understood at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. It, eternally with God in the sense that now she's in the eternity of God. And she was eternally in God's mind uh, insofar as she was predestined to be the Immaculate Conception. She was foreseen since uh, the beginning of time, if we want, or better to say since eternity, because God is eternal. She was uh, foreseen as Immaculate. So in that sense, she is in God's eternity. Uh, but she's always with God because she, in fact, as immaculate, is the new creation. And, uh, and she is the creation that was meant to be if Adam had not sinned. So she's the true creation, what God had in mind, what God had wanted the creation to be, uh, to be unsullied, to be immaculate, to be uh, the that kind of response, immaculate response to his love, a response from a bride to love the, the, the bridegroom uh, as uh, in uh, total, uh, with total, uh, the perfection of love. So Our Lady is that creation. And as the perfect creation, she is that heaven on earth. Because uh, her, her will, her will is, is always... Uh, free, of course. She has the perfect freedom, the freedom to say, yes, I love you to God. I am always with you. I respond on behalf of all these, your children who unfortunately have said no, I say yes. Uh, and uh, for this reason, in her, uh, her heart, her person is that heaven on earth. If you want to know where God abides on earth, you have to find the Immaculate Heart of Mary, right? Mm. Yes, sir. Which is also the tabernacle of Christ. Mm. The tabernacle in our church, in our parishes, is a symbol of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Yes. I mean, that's also, I, mean, I think in the Apocalypse they have a monstrance which is quite unique in that um, where the heart of Our Lady was, there's a, that's where the, the Eucharist is, is kept. Is kept, yes. Um, we should design a monstrance uh, with Our Lady and the very place where Jesus is put, uh, standard is, should be the Immaculate Heart. We have to ask an artist to design a beautiful monstrance, Our Lady holding and um, standing the Holy Eucharist from her heart. Yes. We have, uh, Damien is asking, Perhaps we've already answered this, but was St. John Hughes the first to talk about the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Well, he was not the first. The first uh, is St. Luke. Uh, yes, and then we have the fathers, we have the doctors. Uh, among them we have, as said before, St. Bernard, St. Bonaventure, St. Bernardine of Siena, and many others. What St. John Hughes did, and did wonderfully, is the fact that he wrote this beautiful compendium, a beautiful treatise, if you want, on the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And he collected all these references, all these writings of the fathers, of the saints, on the Immaculate Heart of Mary to present a masterpiece, a, a work dedicated completely to the mystery of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of Mary. So it's not the first, but he's one of the most representatives of this the spirituality, this devotion to the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary by developing the idea of the most sacred heart of Mary, of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And it is also significant, I just wish to add this, uh, historically speaking, that uh, uh, contemporary to St. John Hughes, uh, there is, uh, is also another saint, a French saint, St. Margaret Maria Lacocque, 
who, by the end of her life, she died 10 years after St. John Hughes. By the end of her life, she received the, that revelation by the second part of Jesus, the nine Fridays of the month in reparation to the most sacred heart of Jesus. So uh, that devotion to the sacred heart is, is in that context, uh, revealed and given as private revelation, as theological intuition uh, as well. And then after them, that revelation, that devotion and theological intuition uh, is more developed. And we come to Fatima, 1970. We come, actually, if we want to be more precise, we come to the most sacred heart of Jesus, uh, to whom Leo the Thirteenth made for the first time the consecration of human cards to the most sacred heart of Jesus, as requested by Jesus to Saint Margaret Mary Lacock, and then requested again and again by other 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 saints, especially one in particular. Then we come to the most sacred heart of Jesus, the humankind consecrated to him, nineteen hundred. And then we come 1917, Fatima, and uh, again the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but uh, by presenting with the angel the two hearts in the reparation prayer of the angel, yes? Mm. The merits, the infinite merits of the most sacred heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Right. <clears throat> so, Arnold John Bosco asks another question. He says, if all the graces flow through Mary, then all the salvation flowing from the Immaculate Heart of Mary is truly justified. It's actually not a question, it's more of a... It's an uh, assertion. Assertion. Yeah. Fine. Do you think it's fine? Yes, well, it's, it's fine. Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> so then Damien says, Can we say, just as all the mysteries of our Lord meet in the Holy Eucharist, so does all the mysteries of Our Lady have its destination as the Immaculate Heart of Mary? to put together the whole Eucharist and Immaculate Heart. I think to say that like all of our Lord's mysteries meet in the Eucharist, mm -hmm. so all of our Lady's mysteries meet in her Immaculate Heart. Yes, okay. I think it is possible to say yes. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of synthesis. Yes, and, uh, and then the whole Eucharist is given from the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It's the very fruit of her love, of her maternal love to Jesus. She gave to Jesus her flesh her blood, and uh, Jesus took uh, his humanity from Adresa to become man, to become bread, holy Eucharist. There's a comment, another one about this biological process right. from Marco. Or, he says, yes, John, through the biological process of microchimerism, it is possible that Mary's heart actually contains some of Jesus' cells and vice versa. Right. This would also explain why biologically Mary had to be assumed into heaven as she was carrying his cells which could not suffer corruption. Mm. There is a possible biological reason, yes, by which it is shown that uh, the cells of the mother present in the, in the sun. Mm. So there is that profound unity also from a biological point of view. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Then we have a comment from um, is it Agnieszka? Agnieszka, yes. Oh, she says we miss the Latin Mass in Poland. Can you send someone to pray Holy Mass for some poor souls here, or are you planning to settle a little community here? God bless you, <laughs> Agnieszka. Better to pray a little bit more. <laughs> but the Poland is so dedicated to our lady, so you might have some. Priests already there celebrating the, the Mass. Okay. <clears throat> then Rahel says, Could the Immaculate Heart of Mary be God's pure and perfect will? Also, due to her Immaculate Conception, she was never separated from God's will. Hence, her will is God's will. Yes. As we said, the very manifestation of the heart is the will. The will manifests the heart, it's the symbol. Uh, Better to say, the heart symbolizes the will. That is the decision, uh, one's decision to follow God's precepts, for example, to do something. And yes, the, the perfect will 
is the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and she was never yes, separated from God's will. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, Aaron John Bosco says, could you please suggest some devotional and meditational practices to the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Devotional practices, well, pray the seven sorrows of Our Lady, or pray, pray the seven glories. Do you know the seven glories? Uh, we should explain this more, maybe in another show. Uh, it's, it's another chaplet written by Father Stefano Manelli to present, to in order to contemplate, the seven glories, starting with the Immaculate Conception, then the Divine Maternity, then the Perpetual Virginity, the Universal Co-Redemption, the Universal Mediation, then the sixth is the Assumption yes. into Heaven, the seventh mm -hmm. is the Coronation of our Blessed Mother in Heaven. So this is another way to contemplate the heart of Mary by considering her, her glories and uh, all the doctrines that uh, crown Ali this immaculate heart, dogmas actually. Yes. Then we have Rahel asks, is that why we say religious sisters are brides of Christ, because of the union of the heart of the nun and Christ, or is there any other explanation to this espousal relationship? <laughs> Fundamental, yes, it is because the sisters are one heart, one will, one soul, with our Lord Jesus Christ. They are spoused with Jesus. And the sisters perfectly resemble this spousal union with uh, Christ, to which everyone is called, because everyone has to love Jesus in a spousal way. But especially religious, in particular the female religious uh, people in the church, represent perfectly that uh, spousal love, because their souls are uh, united with one will to Christ. Mm. Yes. Then um, Damien says, are there two titles, the Immaculate Heart of Mary and Our Lady of the Sacred Heart, the same? If yes, then why two distinct titles? Well, uh, there are two distinct devotions, if you want. Uh, the content is per se the same, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, pointing especially to the mystery of Immaculate Conception, but also there are in history and in some authors that you find in this beautiful book, The Admirable Heart of Mary, some authors make a reference to Our Lady of the Most Sacred Heart. And also in here, in Gospel, in our diocese, uh, uh, the, the, the church in Gospel, St. Mary's, uh, actually was dedicated uh, at the very early stage of its building, uh, it was that the Our Lady of the Most Sacred Heart was, so there was a reference to Our Lady and the, the, the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, the distinction is this, the Immaculate Heart points to the place Immaculate, which is Our Lady's inner life, while Our Lady of the Most Sacred Heart points to the relation with the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Right. Anyone else? We are coming to a close now. Mm -hmm. I think any any other I mean, last one. There's one last comment from last comment. Rahel saying, won't people say that Jesus cannot be married to anyone, so how can he be the bridegroom of religious sisters? <laughs> he was not married to a human person, but uh, he's married to the church, right? Is the spouse of the church, and the church is a spouse to Christ. Who is the church? In premise, it is Our Lady. She is the perfect church. So Christ is a spouse with Our Lady. And he's a spouse with all souls uh, componing the church. So he's a spouse with all faithful, and in, in particular with those souls who leave that spousal love in a closer way to the love of Jesus with the church. In this sense, yes, the sisters and the friars as well, and all religious in the church can be considered in a very unique way, spouses of Christ. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you everyone for your attention for following this show. I think we, uh, by Ali's grace, did a good service. Hopefully, for you to make your faith grow 
and to discover more. Of course, we can always say more and ourselves can understand more, but we thank our lady and each one of you for following. Uh, please leave a nice thumb up <laughs> and share this, this show with your friends. Okay, now it's time to pray the angels and we finish with this prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done to me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt amongst us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, the Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray, go forth, we beseech thee, O Lord. Thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, every this day be at my side, to the light and guard, to the and guide. Amen. Eternal rest, grant unto them, O Lord. And let the virtual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Let us conclude with the final blessing. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God, with the intercession of the Immaculate and Admirable Heart of Mary, bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carlino. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Amen.